Welcome to The Catholic Perspective, a podcast brought to you by rcspirituality.org. Enjoy the episode. Some straight talk about atheism. In Whitaker Chambers, the great American writer and editor who exposed Alger Hiss and other communist espionage agents at the start of the Cold War, had been a devout and committed communist himself. He was fully convinced of the materialistic and atheistic communist dogma. In his famous autobiography called Witness, which is uh, well worth the read, by the way, he describes how this atheistic worldview began to crumble. It happened kind of casually. He was watching his little daughter at breakfast, and his eye came to rest on her ear. He looked at those intricate, perfect ears. The thought passed through his mind that those ears could have been created only through a project of immense design. The thought, as he later said, was involuntary and unwelcome, but eventually it led him to the reasonable conclusion, belief in God. Indeed, the church makes it clear that believing in God is not only reasonable, but it is even more reasonable than not believing in God, though disbelief always does have some so-called reasons. And even though the doctrines specific to Christianity, like the Trinity and the Incarnation, are revealed by God and thus require a supernatural faith in order to be accepted, the existence of a supreme being and our moral obligation to live in obedience to his will are truths that human reason can and should arrive at even without the assistance of faith. But because today's Catholic lives and works in a world where various forms of atheism are alive and well, in a world where militant atheists like uh, Sigmund Freud and Jean-Paul Sartre and Friedrich Nietzsche are hailed as heroic saviors, because of this, we need to understand deeply both the reasonableness of our faith in God and the reasons why so many people don't share that faith so that we can witness to the world and not be worn down by the world. This is especially true at the university, where the arts and sciences are most often taught without any reference to God at all. We need to be armed against the atheistic agenda, uh, lest we unknowingly kind of drink it in as we delve into the latest research in computer science, history, and marine biology. So in the next few minutes, we will take, uh, first we'll take a look at some reasons that show why God's existence is far from an irrational claim. And then second, we'll take a look at some of the most common reasons for rejecting God's existence. But we'll start with a disclaimer. Although there are plenty of reasons to believe in the existence of God, there are no definitive proofs of his existence. In the natural sciences, we can prove things definitively by isolating them, comprehending them through observation, measurement, experimentation. But God, by definition, transcends the physical realm. And since he created it, he's beyond it, right? Therefore, we cannot observe, measure, and experiment on God in the way we can with, uh, with mice or bacteria or projectile motion. So to expect a proof for the existence of God to be as clear and definitive as a proof for the existence of photosynthesis is an unreasonable, irrational expectation. By definition, God simply can't fit inside of a test tube. Instead of proofs, therefore, the Catechism actually speaks of converging and convincing arguments which start from our experience of creation. And just as you can learn a lot about an artist from studying his works of art, so too we can approach God through reflecting on his work of creation. So first we'll take a look at the creation in general and then uh, take a close-up on the human person. So when we reflect on the world around us, we see a kind of immense living machine, a universe made of innumerable components that all fit perfectly together. Everything is connected. Everything has its own place and function. And the more we learn about this universe, the more we delve into the minute details of DNA and the vast expanses of distant galaxies, the more complex and amazing we find its organization. And just as we run across a complex machine, 
like a car or a computer, we reasonably assume that somebody designed it. So too, when we reflect on the magnificent order and complexity of the universe, it is not unreasonable to deduce that it had a designer who's commonly called God. And then if we question ourselves a little bit further, asking why the universe as a whole exists in the first place, we're pointed in the same direction. No single part of the universe could have produced the whole of it, any more than a wall of a house could have produced its roof. Even if there was a Big Bang, it is unreasonable to assume that there was no Big Banger. It is reasonable to assume that there was. Imagine that you're standing in front of the Mona Lisa. Imagine then that somebody comes up beside you and starts to explain that this painting was the product of a random application of paint to the canvas. Someone had built a machine that plopped pigment on canvases over and over again. And after about three billion random plops, the Mona Lisa suddenly appeared in all its glory. Possible, right? Theoretically. Now imagine that someone else walks up and suggests that the painting was actually painted by an artistic genius. Now, if you had no access to the documents that definitively trace the origins of the painting to the studio of Leonardo da Vinci, you would have to believe one of these explanations. And I think it's clear which is the more reasonable proposition. But even if you accepted the former explanation, it doesn't explain where the pigments in the canvases came from in the first place. So the physical world itself cries out for a designer and a creator. But then if we reflect on the reality of the human person in particular, we find even more reasons to believe in in a transcendent supreme being of some sort. A human being shares physical existence and biological needs with minerals, plants, and animals. But we also diverge considerably from them. For instance, we can know and communicate back and forth unchangeable truths, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, and nothing can be and not be at the same time in the same way. But where do we see these unchangeable truths? Everything around us is changeable. Even our minds are changeable. Unchangeable truth seems to indicate the existence of a realm of unchanging reality, a spiritual realm, a divine realm. Likewise, the human person experiences another phenomenon, that of moral obligation to do good and to avoid evil. Now, some people will disagree about what is good and what is evil in particular circumstances, but all peoples, all cultures agree that we are obliged to do good and avoid evil, to follow the dictates of our conscience, even when we really would prefer not to. This this sense of absolute moral obligation points to an extrinsic moral authority, a source of pure goodness that comes not from ourselves, if it did, it would never make us feel uncomfortable, which it often does, and not from other people. If it did, we would not feel the obligation when we were alone, but we often do. So this experience that we have of absolute moral obligation seems to imply an absolute moral authority, which is commonly referred to as God. So by reflecting on the world and the human person, we find a lot of road signs, and these are just some, there's many more, We find road signs kind of pointing to the existence of a supreme being, of God. Now again, the church admits that these are not scientific proofs, like the ones derived from laboratory experiments. But they certainly show that believing in God is not irrational. Besides, even if they don't prove God's existence with scientific exactitude, neither can the various brands of atheism disprove that existence with scientific exactitude. I mean, they can just offer other explanations of these same phenomena. Most of the times, if you, if you reflect on it, those explanations don't really exclude God's existence at all. Some theories of evolution, for example, offer an explanation for the process by which the amazing variety of life forms gradually emerged on the earth, but they don't, and they can't, offer an explanation for where that process came from, for where and why it ultimately began. But if that's the case, if it's so reasonable to believe in God, why do so many people not believe? Well, simply put, because we are not purely reasonable beings. We also have emotions, passions, selfish desires, 
and other tendencies at work in us. So even if believing in God is the most rational position, that doesn't mean that we will automatically adopt it. As the Catechism puts it, quote, This intimate and vital bond of man to God can be forgotten, overlooked, or even explicitly rejected. End quote. Dr. Peter Kreeft, a philosopher and a convert to the faith, has listed some of the causes, common causes, behind this kind of unnatural rejection of God in his book, Catholic Christianity, an excellent read, by the way, published by Ignatius Press. And it's worth taking a look at part of his list, just so we understand more clearly that when people reject God, they always have some kind of a motivation to do so. And if we want to help them back into the fold, we have to discover and defuse that motivation. So here are seven of the main causes for the choice not to believe in God and their counter causes. As we go through them, try to, to see which ones apply to people you know who claim not to believe. Reason number one, the problem of evil. This is a, a kind of a, a revolt against evil in the world and against the God who does not act as we think he should to defeat evil as quickly as we would wish. And of course, faith's one-word answer to the problem of evil is, wait. God will conquer all evil in time, in the end, but we have to go through the middle of the story to get to the end. Reason number two, ignorance or misunderstanding. A lot of people don't believe in God simply because their conception of God is out of whack. It's up to us to upgrade those misconceptions. Reason number three the scandal of bad example on the part of believers. This is perhaps one of the most common reasons for atheism. When people who do claim to believe in God live unattractive or hypocritical lives, it really turns others off. Even that, however, is an irrational, though often very convincing, reason for disbelief. After all, do we refuse to love because there are some bad lovers? Do we refuse to marry because there are some bad husbands and wives? Reason number four, the refusal to repent and give up some cherished sin. We know, or we suspect, that if we let God into our lives, certain habits of self-indulgence will have to go. And, frankly, we don't like to give them up. But those who have given them up, those who, who let God's grace into their lives so he can transform them, all say the same thing, that it is a joyful liberation, like being freed from a drug habit. Reason number five, fear. Fear, eh, possibly, of what God may demand, but above all, fear of rejection or scorn from other people, from family, friends, professors, employers. But this is another emotional argument. Rationally, isn't it better to suffer rejection by some people for a little while in order to enter into everlasting friendship with God? Reason number six, pride. The demand to play God, to be in control, to have our own way. This is an irrational reason that often hides behind apparently rational arguments. It's the, uh, the selfish, spoiled baby's philosophy of life. I want what I want, when I want it, and since God won't spoil me like that, I'll pretend he doesn't exist. And reason number seven, the difficulty in trusting God as father if we have experienced broken families and absent or unloving human fathers. This is a real difficulty, but if you think about it, if our trust has been betrayed by people, that's all the more reason to trust God. It is not reasonable to refuse the only lifeboat that can save us when all the other boats have sunk. So those are some reasons why some people refuse to believe in God. Understanding those reasons and the powerful influence they can have on people is the first step towards helping them find even more powerful reasons for believing in God. Ultimately, however, God himself is the great instigator of faith, the great convincer, which is why we should bolster all of our rational arguments with heartfelt prayer. As the Catechism puts it, quote, Although man can forget God or reject him, God never ceases to call every man to seek him so as to find life 
and happiness. End quote. God never ceases to call everyone to seek him so as to find life and happiness. And that's some straight talk about atheism. You have been listening to The Catholic Perspective, a resource from rcspirituality.org. Please visit our website and check out more great resources to help you pray, learn, grow, and go. Please join our team of digital missionaries by subscribing at rcspirituality.org.